професор Мигялкова, уважаеми колеги, позволете ми да приветстваме с добре дошли нашите гости, експерти от университета в Ковентри, професор Брайан Мус. Доктор Джордж Константино. Добре дошли и на експертите от Министерството на тази социалната политика, госпожа Снежа Ангелова и госпожа Само преди месец Европейската комисия обяви начало на конкурс за инициативи в сферата на предприемачеството и обяви година 2014 за година на предприемаческите дейности. Нашата инициатива днес утре и всички дейности в рамките на проекта отлично се вписват именно в годината на предприемачеството. Основната цел на нашия проект е обогатяване на съществуващите методики за обучение и университетски менеджмент чрез разработване на адаптиран модел и план за действие, за трансфер на опита на Coventry University Enterprises в Варненски свободен университет. Като този модел, ние ще се опитаме да имплементираме именно в дейностите на Международната академия знания и инновации. В тази връзка предстоят различни инициативи. Първата от тях тази година е именно майсовския клас, който се стои от два семинара, които ще се проведат в рамките на днешния и годишния ден ще започне именно реализацията на инициативата по дигитално предприемачество в Варнския свободен университет. Експертите от Ховандри ще ни представят техния модел, техните теоретични и практически аспекти на функциониране на предприемаческия университет. Силната връзка между обучение и изследване е ориентирани към конкретните потребности на бизнеса, и осъществяване чрез прилагане на дигиталните технологии. Нашите гости са представители именно на технологичния парк на университета в Ковенбин. Професор Брайан Мур е директор на Центъра за интелектуална собственост в университета в Ковенбин и отговаря за политиката, защитата, оценката и комерциализацията на всички форми на интелектуална собственост. Той управлява портфолио от 20 патентни ведомства, търговски марки, дизайни и авторски права. Той има 25 отишен опит в областта на интелектуалната собственост, като създател на 6 патента и със собствено на 3 търговски марки. Професор Мур активно участва в създаването на 12 компании, ползващи продукти на интелектуалната собственост и в привличането на инвестиции към тях. Завършили докторската си степен в Нобъл, като е работил към френското правителство. В момента е и оценител на проектни предложения и експерт към Европейската комисия. Госпожа Сузицин е назначена като ръководител проекти в Университета Ковентри през 2006 година, след придобиване на мъжка си степен в областта на международния бизнес. Работейки в отделът на проектно управление в Института за сериозно три, тя активно участва в ръководството на проекти, финансирани от ДЕС и насочени към дейности на регионално економическо развитие, бизнес и инновативна подкрепа, трансферни технологии, интернационализация и предприемачество. По настоящем, тя координира редица големи международни проекти, като един от тях е Blue Games, на стоеност 2 милиона евро, с участието на 14 партньора от цяла Европа, който има за основна цел да стимулира сектора видеоигри в бизнес. Госпожат си има особен интерес към творческите индустрии, и дигиталните медии и по-настоящно разработва диссертационен труд в тази област. Доктор Джордж Константино е ръководител проекти в Института за сериозни игри. Института за сериозни игри, колеги, е един от трите големи института в технологичния парк на Ковенбри, който подкрепя развитието на цифровите технологии, по-конкретно сериозни игри, 3D анимации, виртуални светове, Обучение е базирано на игри, мобилни приложения и свързаните с тях технологии. 
Този институт включва учебно-тренировачен център, специализиран технологичен инкубатор и лаборатория за разработка на мобилни приложения. Именно доктор Джордж Константин оглавява този център. И един разрастващ се екип, който работи с два големи финансирани от Европейския регионален фонд за развитие и технологични проекта. Той е пряко свързан и с проекти в сферата на дигиталните медии в района на West Midlands в Великобритания и специализира в идентифицирането на технологичните нужди на каквато и да е търговска дейност от независими економични търговци до големи корпорации. Джордж Константинов ръководи ни инициативи в рамките на региона, свързани с пазара на бизнес игри, като това включва развитието и създаването на цифрова мрежа на основата на разширена виртуална реалност. Под негово ръководство се организират семинари и консултации по инновативни технологии за предприемачи и бизнес лидери. Позволете ми причинато на ръководството да открия семинара Дигитално предприемачество, като предоставя думата на професор Брайан Мур. Good morning, everyone. Only two languages I know. Good morning and bonjour. It is my great pleasure to be here in Varna again. We were here two years ago and had a fantastic time seeing all of your facilities. I must thank Theodora very much for the hospitality. Today I would like to talk to you about how we go about starting entrepreneurial companies and how we encourage those to grow within our university. I am absolutely passionate about starting companies and my problem is I will probably start speaking quicker and quicker. Stop me doing that, put your hand up and I will go slower. The other thing I would like to say to you all is uh, please would you ask me questions uh, as, we're, as I go along. Don't wait until the end, I'm very happy for you to ask me any questions you like and I will answer them at the time, okay? So this is an interactive session, please enjoy it and please ask me as many questions as possible. What I would like to talk to you about today is a basic introduction to our university and our vision and our uh, strategy behind startup companies and interaction with businesses. Then I would like to go into talking about what makes successful entrepreneurial companies in terms of the support they get from us, the university. This is both for students and for staff. And the thing which is most important at any university or any establishment around the world is a very good, strong leadership who back entrepreneurs and make sure they will succeed. The next thing I'd like to talk about is how you deliver the physical space and the resources and incubators to make sure companies can thrive and grow. Then training, education and mentoring are extremely important for any business because the first thing to say about a company or an entrepreneur is the successful entrepreneurs in this world are those who not only know what they are good at but more importantly they know what they are not good at and therefore they will ask for support and they will ask for um, business support to make sure those companies survive. As a member of staff, as an academic or as a student, you will have a particular skill. That will be in engineering, say, or digital communications, ICT, and that's where your training is important. However, if you want to start a business, you might never have had any business training. And that is why it's so important that we can provide that and make sure the transition between being a researcher or an academic is smooth towards being a director of a company and making sure they survive. And that's to do with time, freedom and expert support. Because nobody can be expected to work well, 24 hours a day and have no rest. You have to have time out and that's what we try to provide at our university to release the lecturers from their commitments on teaching so they can start companies successfully. And then hopefully we'll have a break 
a coffee break. And I would like to then follow up on a couple of examples of companies we started within the last decade that have both been very successful and one of them we've just sold our real estate in. And as I say, please will you interrupt and ask questions. Coventry University is an academic institute at the top of this slide, but below that we have a lot of facilities in support of businesses. We have teaching schools and faculties. We do a lot of research, particularly industry-led applied research. We have a London campus because we realised five years ago that half the students want to come and live in London and therefore we opened up a campus in the city of London which means that our business students can get a better education and training. We have a college and then we have underneath that a set of people who are paid for through our come to later higher education innovation fund to support that. We also have a set of companies. These are the companies which are wholly owned by the university. There's a Cure Solutions in a training company. Serious Games International, George will talk to you about tomorrow in a lot of detail. Coventry uh, Social Enterprise is a company set up to create social enterprises which are charities or community of interest companies. They are not for profit organisations and we have a students union and we have a, a consultancy company called CU Services. So as we grow as a university, we create more and more companies to meet the demand uh, out there in the community. I work in the wholly owned subsidiary of Coventry <coughs> University called Coventry University Enterprises Limited. Our principal activities are delivery of our European funded projects, exploitation of our groups, intellectual property, which is what I do, development and management of the company's property assets and technology park, and support of the university applied research. As a spin-out company, we have a turnover of about £14 million per year currently. So Coventry University, we rely on delivering high quality education. We have very large focus research programmes. Um, we work very closely with business, in fact we are the largest business facing university in the United Kingdom. Um, we have invested in the last five years over £200 million in new buildings on the campus. And I know you have plans here in Varna to do similar things which is very, very good. We have seen a huge increase in the number of students wanting to apply to Coventry because our facilities now are some of the best in the UK. We have a new postgraduate building refurbished. We have a state-of-the-art engineering and computing building, which was opened last year. And we are now going to build a new science lab, which is called a super lab, to make sure in the next 50 years we can deliver science degrees to students. So the point here is we are investing seriously in making sure the education, <coughs> training and research are really well delivered. This shows a slide of the city of Coventry in the evening. We have over 24,000 students, 5,000 international students from over 140 different countries and research across the globe. One of our main aims is to expand and internationalise, which again is one of your aims as a university here in Varna. And we have an international business activity all around the world. What is most important, I think, for our spin-out companies is to have an incubator which delivers the services that they require uh, in succeeding. And this shows a slide of our technology park when it first started, it's a piece of land, and now it is completely full. The picture on the right hand side shows the technology park and technology uh, innovation village. And I will come into a bit more detail of how we started that and why it grew so quickly. So the technology park has property, we let the property, we manage the services, we have about 20,000 square metres of space to let out to businesses. The first centre we started was the Innovation Centre. So if you are a small company or a business that's just starting out, particularly if you are a staff or students, you might only want to rent one room. You don't need a lot of space. And therefore we set up the Innovation Centre to meet that demand. 
As you grow as a company, you don't want to leave the technology park, but you move then to our enterprise centre, which is more space, two or three offices. If you grow even further, a larger company, you want to move into the innovation village, where you can hire a whole building, or you can hire half a building. So as you grow and develop as a company, all of the facilities which you require are there on the one technology park. And the last thing we opened was a simulation centre, which is really high visualisation and virtual world. So this is our model, and this is what we would recommend that you do in terms of looking at starting companies. Your primary aim is going to be teaching as a university, and on top of the teaching you will have applied research, and then on top of that you need good business support. And that's crucial to making sure your research is translated into startup companies. And on top of that, we offer commercial activity consultancy. So as academics or members of staff, you will be consultants as well. And it's making sure the whole package is linked together effectively. And that's what we do at CUE. The other things you see there, ICE is an institute of applied um, creative enterprise. The HDTI is the Health Design and Technology Institute. SDI is a Serious Games Institute. And the Institute for Applied Entrepreneurship is where we support all of our students in their business startups. And later I think George will talk to you about the Serious Games Institute. The point about an institute is it's not academic and it's not business. It's halfway between the two. So you set up a centre which is uh, based on academic teaching and learning but delivers services to industry. And that's what institutes are there to do. And they are the halfway house between the university and a full business company. This shows the Health Design Technology Institute. Um, there, it's been operating now for three or four years. And it was set up to deliver assisted living technology, which includes a lot of digital work. Uh, it will make sure that businesses get their prototypes made properly, they get these tested properly, and there's a manufacturing route to take those to market. Because what I will come to later in terms of entrepreneurship is the idea is the easy thing to have. The idea is what you have in your head, but getting that idea to a business or a product which is sold on the marketplace can be a very long process that it does need support. And this is the Serious Games Institute, um, which is based, as George will talk, talk to you later, about building digital technology. Immersive technologies, augmented reality, and he will go into some detail about the products which are made there and why they're made and the rationale behind them. So, commercial development services, these deliver economic development programs and innovation business support. So, we have a strong base on international business and technology transfer. We will look at creative industries as well because not only are we an engineering and science based university. But like you, we have a very good school of art and design. And a lot of our companies are not technology based at all. They're actually come out of art and design, based on design work. The Institute of Applied Entrepreneurship is a home for all enterprise for our students. And I deliver intellectual property services uh, to the university. OK, so that's a little oversight of what we do as a structure, as a university. So why is leadership so important? What we had to do in the first instance was set out a vision to say that we wanted to significantly increase enterprise activity at our university. We needed to better coordinate and maximise our activities. When we started 10 years ago, if you were a student, you went down one route for business support. If you were a member of staff or an academic, you went down another route for support. And we thought this just wasn't working properly. We should be offering a single service which is uniform and consistent for both staff and for students. So we're now coordinating all of our activity around one offering for everybody, and I'll explain how that works later. We needed to drive targeted activity in those areas of potential growth. So like you as a university, we have areas of uh, research which are significant within our economy and within the global economy as well. Things like low carbon buildings, things like digital economy, uh, the ageing population and health. So all these areas are significant areas of our research. So we were coordinating those together. And really we need to ensure the university maximises potential income from all of our intellectual property. 
And that was what I had to do. And our vision then was to be uh, the UK's leading university for company startups uh, and for licensing. And that's a very easy thing to say, we want to be the UK's leader, but you have to get there. And it took at least five years of committed leadership from the top of the university to put in place all of that, those actions necessary to achieve that end. And the commitment, we are now backed by £2,850,000 per year of higher education innovation fund money to support our business activities. So that's the kind of level of activity you need to generate the outputs that we wanted in terms of spin-outs and licensing. So as a university now, we currently spin out about 30 companies um, from student IP, and we spin out two or three companies from our staff IP per year. So you can see it's quite a, quite a big activity. Something that's important for everybody is communication. If you don't communicate your vision or your policies to people, they won't know about it. So in the last five or ten years, we are using all of the social media to its maximum extent that we possibly can. And I would advise you all, as individuals and as a university, to make sure you are networked in as best you possibly can be, because the activity generated through our social networks far outweighs anything we can do marketing elsewhere. So all of our activity we now have on Twitter, we have uh, LinkedIn, <coughs> Facebook, WhatsApp, you've probably heard about, and we have a lot of our material on YouTube. So people can view this at any time. I think now it's a good opportunity for me to just have a little rest and let you see a small video which shows you our ethos behind of where we go as a university in terms of idea generation and how the internet and our digital economy has changed our outlook completely. Because I'm talking generally about how we start companies in any sector. That could be engineering, could be manufacturing, could be fashion and design, we do it all. But one of the things which is important in the communication sector is businesses grow very quickly in the digital sector. And the reason they do is they've got access to billions of people on the internet almost instantaneously. So whereas an engineering manufacturing company might take many years to get to market, if you produce a very good game, training material or an app, you have access to millions of people instantaneously. And if you heard about three weeks ago, WhatsApp was bought by Facebook for about $16 billion. And it was based not on its tangible assets, it was based entirely on the fact that they had intellectual property and intangible assets worth that much. And it was worth that much because WhatsApp was touching 450 million people every single month. And the trigger point for a business is a billion people a month and you're made. So Facebook realised very quickly if they wanted access to a billion people per month they needed to buy WhatsApp. WhatsApp has less than 50 people working for it. 50 people, $16.9 billion, and you're made. So the rapid growth of internet companies, digital companies, gaming companies, means that you're in a different league to a lot of other startups. And you have to plan that business very carefully early on to hit the right targets. So now if I'd like to just show a quick video for about four minutes. Are there any questions at all on what I've said so far? Does that seem reasonable to you in terms of university support? Where are good ideas coming from? It's a kind of problem I think all of us are intrinsically interested in. We want to be more creative. We want to come up with better ideas. We want our organizations to be more innovative. I've looked at this problem from an environmental perspective. What are the spaces that have historically led to unusual rates of creativity and innovation? And what I've found in all these systems, there are these recurring patterns that you see again and again that are crucial to creating environments that are unusually innovative. One pattern I call the slow hunch. The breakthrough ideas almost never come in a moment of great insight in a sudden stroke of inspiration. Most important ideas take a long time to evolve and they spend a long time dormant in the background. 
It isn't until the idea has had two or three years, sometimes 10 or 20 years, to mature that it suddenly becomes accessible to you and useful to you in a certain way. And this is partially because good ideas normally come from the collision between smaller hunches so that they form something bigger than themselves. So you see a lot in the history of innovation cases of, of someone who has half of an idea. There's a great story about the invention of the World Wide Web and Tim Berners-Lee. This is a project that Berners-Lee worked on for 10 years. But when he started, he didn't have a full vision for this new medium he was going to invent. He started working on one project as a side project to help him organize his own data. He scrapped that after a couple of years, and he started working on another thing. And only after about 10 years did the full vision of the World Wide Web come into being. That is, more often than not, how ideas happen. They need time to incubate. And they spend a lot of time in this partial hunch form. The other thing that's important when you think about ideas this way is that when ideas take form in this hunch state, they need to collide with other hunches. Oftentimes, the thing that turns a hunch into a real breakthrough is another hunch that's lurking in somebody else's mind. And you have to figure out a way to create systems that allow those hunches to come together and turn into something bigger than the sum of their parts. That's why, for instance, the coffee house in the age of the Enlightenment or the Parisian salons of, of modernism were such engines of creativity because they created a space where ideas could mingle and swap and create new forms. When you look at the problem of innovation from this perspective, it sheds a lot of important light on the debate we've been having recently about what the internet is doing to our brains. Are we getting overwhelmed with an always connected, multitasking lifestyle? And is that going to lead to less sophisticated thoughts as we move away from the slower, deeper, contemplative state of reading, for instance? Obviously, I'm a big fan of reading. But I think it's important to remember that the great driver of scientific innovation and technological innovation has been the historic increase in connectivity and our ability to reach out and exchange ideas with other people and to borrow other people's hunches and combine them with our hunches and turn them into something new. That really has, I think, been, more than anything else, the primary engine of creativity and innovation over the last 600 or 700 years. And so yes, it's true we're more distracted. But what has happened that is really miraculous and marvelous over the last 15 years is that we have so many new ways to connect and so many new ways to reach out and find other people who have that missing piece that will complete the idea we're working on or to stumble serendipitously across some amazing new piece of information that we can use to build and improve our own ideas. That's the real lesson of where good ideas come from, the chance favors the connected mind. So, do you all agree with that? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And that's exactly what we try to do in the university space, is to get people to talk together who aren't in the same disciplines and in the same departments. So that spark that often creates new companies will come from the Serious Games Institute because they can do things which the um, life sciences or the engineers never dreamt could happen. It's that kind of atmosphere of talking to people with your idea talking to other people who have maybe got a similar idea and coming together to create a good company. If you don't talk to people, you won't get a company that will survive. You have to keep communicating and that's what that was saying in that little video. And if you're interested in that kind of teaching, it's sketch teaching, there's a, there are a lot of videos on YouTube which are like that and they're very, very intuitive. They're very well done. And they talk about things like education, and why education today is totally different to education 20, 30 years ago. If I was lecturing now at Coventry, I wouldn't be talking to you as an audience like I am now. I would be using an awful lot of interactive material, a lot of demonstrators to make it more interesting, more enlightening for you, and to give you more opportunities. So the classroom lecture is now going away. We do a lot of our lecturing through um, apps on your mobile phone. It's education anywhere, anytime, any place. And that's where we're moving now as a university. Okay, so that's a bit about um, why we do that. We provide a physical and virtual environment. You don't have to do it all in a physical space. Um, you can do it in virtual environments as well, and that's what we provide. You know, the key, the key components of developing sustaining growth 
the emerging technology transfer industry of those, using best practice as well. So we need to ensure a sustainable and successful operation of business the incubation is there. And that's why I explained if you want one room, two rooms, three rooms, laboratories, they are all available to you at very much reduced rates as well. So when you compete in, a, in this global economy as a startup company, often you have very little money and you have very little resources and therefore you have to have good support in terms of realistic pricing. We will provide things like boards to companies as well. I'll come to that later in more detail. We will help in terms of operational plans and sharing innovations across all of our networks. And this shows what we do in a, in a simple diagram. At the left hand side of the picture, it's probably someone who has a very good idea. They don't really know where to go with it. They haven't done anything with it. They don't really know what their market is. And therefore, we have to take it across that bridge. You know, we have to look at getting it to a position where it's a company, it's started, it has its funding, and more importantly, it knows its market, and it knows its customers, and it knows how to enter that market. So that's the most important thing. We always say, when you start any business, the one thing you have to know is what your customer is going to buy, and what your customer wants to buy. It's no good having a great scientific idea if nobody wants to buy it. You have to shape that into something which is a real business. So that's what we're doing. We're bridging that gap from high risk, unproven technology or ideas, particularly in the digital space, and creating an environment whereby we end up with successful companies which have already started. What I do then is I look at the an intellectual property of the university and I make sure that it's used properly and you must do the same in your business. One of the last things a business man or woman will think about is what intellectual property do I own? So if I was talking to you in the digital space, uh, what percentage of your businesses would be intellectual property and intellectual capital? Does anyone know? If you start an ICT company, what are you actually investing in then? You're investing in your knowledge. It's a knowledge you're investing in. So if you bought Google, like I was saying, WhatsApp, 16.9 billion, Google is 97% intellectual property and intellectual assets. Because we are living in the knowledge-based economy. We're not living in an economy where capital assets really mean so much these days. If I was talking to you 30 years ago or 40 years ago, in 1975, most businesses had only 17% of their wealth in their intellectual property. Only 17%. Now it's over 80%. And it's because we're living in a global connected economy. So when you're thinking about your business, think about what you own and think about carefully how you want to protect that intellectual property. Because if it's copyright, you don't pay anything for it. It's international protection. If it's a patent, of course, you then have to go through another process. So number one, when you think about your business opportunity, what do you own? as an individual or as a company, make sure it's protected properly and then you're on a good footing to start your business. So these are examples of some of the businesses we've started in the last uh, 10 years or so. The first two I will use as examples of what we've done. Um, they are in very different areas. Sprue Age is, is an electronics company. Exilica is a nanotechnology company. Microcab is cars, hydrogen fuel cell cars. Health Behaviour Research is an internet-based research uh, company in the health sector, delivering advice to people. InnoCardia is a drug screening company. Future Armour is a fashion company, delivering high-end fashion to construction workers. And Tortrix is, a, is an ICT company, a software company. So these are all examples of companies we've started in the last few years. <coughs> The Institute of Applied Entrepreneurship now is where we focus our activity for our students. Because a lot of our students will come with good ideas which we as a university don't have ownership of. They want to make their own business. So we offer the same services to them, the same business support. And I'll come to you later how we deal with the training and education part for students to make sure that within a year they have the right skills to be able to make their business survive. One of the things we offer is Speed, or Speed Plus, and this is a set of courses along with money. 
So our students get given £4,000 when they enter the university to start their own business. And they can also choose which courses they take uh, when they start their business. So when you come in as an 18 year old or a 19 year old, you've got a good idea in your head of what will be a business and you want it to be your business, you come to our university and we will give you the opportunity to choose which modules you take to get your business degree. We will give you some money to help you start your company, which might go towards mentoring or it might go towards intellectual property protection. And at the end of those three years, you have a degree in a business degree and you also have a company started and hopefully you're making a lot of money from that. And that's a very nice model. And it's going away from the old you know, model of you come to university to learn a specific subject like engineering because you want to be employed by one of the very large companies and you'll have a job for life in those large companies. That doesn't work today at all. The opportunity is if you want to, you should be able to start your own business and have the right support to do that. And this goes to show some of the um, courses we give and offers we have for our students. At Plus Vantage are those modules I said which cover all aspects of starting, running and growing a business. And as an individual you can choose which ones you want to take. If some of them don't fit what you want to do, you don't take them. But you build up your degree based on those modules. And they cover things like intellectual property, marketing, sales, the use of technology in your business, all these things are very important. You can also get a, a, a BA in Enterprise and Entrepreneurship, that's a BA qualification. You can then go further and get your Masters in Entrepreneurship and a Professional Doctorate in, in Entrepreneurship. So you can see that if you wanted to stay at the university, do all of those qualifications, you can do them step by step to build up as a, a real serial entrepreneur. We do systemic entrepreneurship within our applied research agenda. We do a lot of work on open innovation, which is sharing things in particular. We do a lot of eco-innovation. We do a lot of work on business incubators and best practice in, in those incubators. And we do a lot of work on technology transfer uh, as an academic subject. But most importantly, you get people. Uh, when you start a business, there's nothing better than having someone who's done it before, they've been successful, and they're in your field. If you get those people as your mentors, you are far more likely to succeed in the business world. So we will bring in the mentors from our industry, and we will allocate those mentors to our students, individual basis, based on their company and where they want to go, and those mentors will help them succeed. And they'll take them through, step by step, what they have to do. The, the SEF you see there stands for Student Enterprise Fund. If you have a good business idea, and you want to get money for it to make it succeed, then what do you have to do? You create, generally, a business plan. And then the business plan is projected or pitched to people who want to fund it. And that's what that is. It's our own university fund, uh, paid for by our governors, uh, and a student can get their money to build their company up. But it's based on the fact they deliver a very good, very concise, uh, elevator pitch based on their business proposition. And the business proposition for an investor is what? Do you know what, invest what do investors look for in a business? They want to make profit. Exactly, it's their exit strategy. They want to say, I'm going to make 10 times my investment within a certain period of time. So if you don't know what they're looking for, uh, you won't get the money from them. So what we do is we go in and we, we will write and help students with their elevator pitches so they are a very compelling business case. You've got the customers, and you've got the, the business plan, and generally, our university, you'll get the money then to back your business. <coughs> and I think that's something that's important for, for any, any um, university. So just very briefly then, these are some of the things that we do offer. I won't go into any, any detail about those. Every year, um, I work with George very closely on a competition. Um, it's called the App Poll Competition, and the idea is very simple. It says to all of our, all our staff and students, if you have a good idea for building a mobile device um, app and it's got commercial potential, tell us what your idea is on one side of A4 paper. So I don't want a whole business plan, I want just one side of A4 paper. And every year we look through 50 or so of these and we choose, thank you, we choose the six 
which we want to take forward for possible funding, and we will fund the three best ideas, and that student or the member of staff then hands it over to George, and George's team will go away, and they will do the blueprinting, and they will build the app for these students and staff, and they will launch it on the iStore or Android platform, and our staff and students then get the money uh, as reward and recognition. So the incentive for them is, come up with a good idea, you don't have to do anything else. George's team will do it all for you. They're the experts in building apps, they know what's going to sell, and George will show you how to do that tomorrow. But the idea is good, because it's generating more and more very, very good ideas each year, uh, from all across the university and all of our university groups. So if that's an idea we can help and support in the future, um, I think we would all like to do that. So if you've got your good ideas and you want to pitch it to us, we can look at that and maybe do the same thing. So that's a very successful bit of work. One of the most important things for our businesses is continually getting up-to-date information on the business world. There's no good just letting a business start and then failing. So every, every couple of months we have breakfast, a business breakfast, and they're free to all of our companies on our technology part. And all we say is, come along, it starts off with a breakfast, you get your breakfast paid for, we'll, we'll give you food, sit through one hour or one and a half hours of business support talks, uh, and that will help your business in the future. So they're selected, this one happens to be on intellectual property coming up um, on the 20th of March, which is this Thursday. So this Thursday, if you wanted to, if you were inclined to, you could turn up, have a breakfast at our technology park, sit through this, and these are experts in the field talking about how businesses should work and should operate. So this is something which I would always say is well worth um, funding if you're a university. Get the right people in at the right time to give these talks. So basically that's how we look at it as a, as a process. I don't like things being linear processes. It doesn't work like that anymore. Things have to be more have to like network and community. So if you're a member of staff or a student, or a graduate or alumni of the university, when you've left Coventry, we will still support businesses in exactly the same way as when you're a student. So we'll give you the training and the skills and the modules as you wish, when you want them. We will look at personal development as you as a person because very few scientists become managing directors of very successful companies. They are very good scientists and will be technical directors we will always bring in the right managing directors to ensure the company works. And all about this is bringing in experience. Now, whatever you say, you know, listen to people who have done it before, and they will be a big support. And this goes on within our Institute for Applied Entrepreneurship. We will do an assessment of how good uh, we as business people think the idea is. And I'm going to go to a uh, good chat after coffee about how we assess the commercial viability. How do you know your business will be successful in the marketplace? So we do the assessment, if, it, if it's good, excuse me, it goes then to CUE Limited, Company University Enterprises, and we will do the business incubation for you, and we will do the growth strategy. So what we try to do is support as much as we possibly can. Don't leave people on their own thinking, how do I do the marketing? How do I do the sales? It's all done for you by people who know what to do. So I think there's a good, it's very hot as well. I don't know whether you're very, uh, it's very hot in here. If we, if we have a, a quick break, can we do that? Of course. Yeah. Exactly. If we have, yeah, it's good. Yes. It's good I think if we have a quick break for about 10 minutes, yeah, have a comfort break. Come back after, after the break, I'll go through a process whereby you can look at commercials. Welcome back. I know we've got the wind, windows and doors open, so it's very good. Okay, so this part of my talk is going to be based on, uh, I hope, a useful tool uh, that you can use when you're looking at uh, how commercially viable your ideas are when you come up with them. So whereas before I was talking about how our, how our university deals with entrepreneurship, this tool is available to anybody who wants to use it. It's not the only one, but it's one that we feel uh, is well worth using. It's called SME Innovate Gate, and it was built up over four or five years through a former FP6 project, Framework Project 6 on the EU. 
And it was built up for the sole purpose of ensuring that companies which weren't going to be viable or successful know about it early on so they can make um, corrective actions, if you like. This graph shows how many businesses fail at the different parts uh, of their uh, growth, if you like. So most companies will fail early on at the exploration and screening stage. But as you get further down towards commercialization, then fewer companies fail because the risk has been reduced. So what we're trying to do is set up a tool that will give you all of the business information that you require early on to make those decisions. And it's based on a concept called stage gates, which you probably all know about. Um, stage gates came about in the mid-1990s from a professor, Robert Cooper, who was a professor in Montreal in Canada. And he said, you need to have a process for any product or service innovation, a process which can give you a decision point, which he called gates, where you could stop or start a project or just hold it. So nowadays, every single large company uh, in the world uses a stage gate process of some kind in assessing their technology portfolio and uh, assessing how good their ideas are. And we break it down into sections. The first part is called the specification. And if the specification looks like it's going to be successful, you go through the gate to the concept development stage. And if that's successful, you generally go through to prototyping or in software, beta testing. Then you go into the detail of the business. And if that's successful, you launch your product. When a company starts on a manufacturing route, all of the money they spend comes in at the detail section. So you don't spend a lot of money on development or concept. You don't generally spend much money on prototyping. But if you have to go to build new manufacturing plant or capacity, then a lot of money comes in at the detail stage. You don't want to go in there if you don't know your product is going to sell because you're wasting your money. <coughs> the problem with StageGate for small companies well, there are two problems. The first one is it can be a very uh, labour-intensive process for large companies. So if you look at the company I used to work for when I was in business, we had a seven stage gate process, seven gates to go through from idea through to market. If you look at one of our leading automotive companies, uh, Jaguar Land Rover, Jaguar Land Rover has 16 gates from coming up with the business idea of a new car, a new vehicle, to launching that vehicle on the marketplace. So that means money and time. And if you're a small company, what don't you have? Money and time. So therefore you have to have a process in place that will reduce that burden on you uh, as a company. So we developed SME InnovateGate uh, to take the best possible uh, practice from the StageGate process and develop it into a much simpler process which an SME or an individual can com complete to give them good business data. And this is what we looked at. And if you look at those gates, the three questions which have to be answered at each of the gates are, uh, are my customers going to buy my product? And you might laugh at that, but I know a lot of software companies who have developed what they consider to be a very good software product aimed at one single organisation. Uh, one company was building software for IBM in Poland. And I said to them, if IBM in Poland don't buy your software, what are you going to do? And they said, no, don't worry. They will buy it. And of course what happened? IBM pulled out of Poland and that company failed. It went bankrupt in about four years. And they were only developing a single product for a single company, never, ever do that in business. You develop, if you can, a platform technology for a lot of companies. So if one fails, you always have someone else to go to. So this is designed to answer some of those questions. There are 10 uh, fundamental questions which you must always ask in any business proposition, regardless of what sector you're in or what business you're in. And this was looked at uh, through our project in Italy, using the automotive companies around Turin, Ferrari, etc. 
We looked at the Turkish military sector. We looked at the agro-food sector in Latvia. And we did the uh, chemical, biochemical industry in the United Kingdom. And we found at the end of this project that these questions are right and applicable to all of those different sectors. It doesn't have to be a product, it could also be a service, so they are they're very standard. And what you tend to find is for an early, an early stage company, it's all about the technology. It's all about how good your technology is. But that's only a very small part of your business case. So we look at the question, how unique is your technology, your idea, and have you got it protected properly? You know, and the more unique it is, and the more protection you've got on it, the higher it will score. And we score each one of these out of 0 to 10. So the maximum you can get is a score of 10, which means your product is very good, or 0, it might just be a very bare idea. So you score your uniqueness of technology, then you look at how ready your technology is for market launch. And very rarely do we find in a university situation the technology is anywhere near the marketplace. It's very rarely in that position. And then we look at your team. Have you got the right people in place to bring your idea, your concept through to market launch? And invariably again for an early startup company, it might be one or two people. And what do you tend to lack as most businesses? Do you know what you tend to lack in a business, regardless of their sector? It's marketing. Most people forget about getting in people who can market the product properly or sell it properly. And that's what you've got to do. In the long run, if you think about it, we are all salesmen or saleswomen. We all have to sell something. I'm trying to sell to you how we do innovation and entrepreneurship, how we use our tools. If you have a business, you have to sell your product or your service to your customers. And that's the most important thing. And have you got the right team? If you haven't got the right team, then we have to help build that up. Then we look at how intense the competition is in the marketplace. If there are a lot of companies um, who are very large, and they have a really big R&D group, and they are very competitive, then we score it um, very low on our part, because we don't want to compete against Google, against Facebook, against those kind of companies. <coughs> we haven't got the financial or the legal strength to compete generally against those companies. So we tend to score it low if there is a lot of competition in the marketplace and it is very intense. Then the most important question for you is, what is my um, unique selling position? What is my competitive advantage in what I've come up with? And a lot of people I talk to can't answer that question. If you can't answer what your unique selling position is, you shouldn't be in business. It might be very simple. It might be that your product does the same as somebody else's, but it's cheaper, it costs less money, and that is your unique selling position. What you tend to find is people will always look for a technological competitive advantage, which might not necessarily be what you want. And then we look at how easy is it to access your market? Um, that's a very good question. Have you got your distributors lined up? Have you got your marketing and your sales team and your agents? All the people who are going to sell your product, do you know who they are? Do you know who your customer is? Is it going to be an intermediary? Are you selling your product business to consumer, B2C? Or are you selling your product business to business? We've got away from using that kind of language in the last few years because you sell person to person. You're actually selling individual to individual, so we tend to go away from business to business, business to consumer. But you have to know who they are. If you don't know who they are, you're not going to score very highly. And then a question about customer conservatism. And this is very, very important. You are in a very lucky position if you are in a digital ICT-based company when you're trying to sell your product to young people who want to buy it. They have to have the product. And things like new mobile phones, Apple, work on this principle. They are selling to people who already want to buy it. They are not conservative. When I was in industry, I was trying to sell a product to people who A, didn't want to buy it, usually, because it was health and safety related. 
and B, would not buy it unless it had gone through seven years of product testing and qualification. So my customers were very, very conservative. And that would score low because I knew it was going to take a long time to get to market. If your product is aimed at the age group, 15 year olds to 24 year olds, and it's a new technology, you're on to a winner because it's a must, must have product. And then we look at the value of the accessible market. And the most important word there is what? Anyone guess? Oh, that's George. If George can answer this one, he'll get it wrong. <laughs> the, the important word there is accessible. It's not the market value, because in most cases from university technology, they will come to me and say, it's a drug and there's a billion dollar market. And I'll say, yes, but we're not going to go for a billion dollar market, are we? Where are we going to enter this market? How are we going to enter this market? Uh, and what's the real size of it? So a lot of the times, they start off with $100 billion of drugs, and it ends, it ends up at $10,000 in your local economy. So you have to be very careful about the value of your accessible market. And then you say, what are my anticipated profit margins? Again, if you are in the digital sector, the ICT sector, the gaming sector, you are onto a winner because your profit margins are very high. The cost of reproducing is very, very low and therefore your profit margins are generally very high. And you score that as well. If you're going to license your technology rather than take it to market yourself, you score that on how high your royalty rate is on selling it. Software is a high royalty rate. You again, if you're in the right sector. If you look at a chemical company, their royalty rates are generally 1% of net selling price. If you're in the ICT sector, you're 20, 25%. So you're getting a, a big uplift there, which is good. And the very last question we say is, have you got the money in place, the funding, to take your product to the marketplace? And invariably that is no. Most companies in our sectors, in our area, will start by getting grant funding. So they'll get money in as grants to start their company, and then they have to get venture capital in and grow in that way. So you answer all of those 10 questions. But you, as an individual, shouldn't answer them for your business because you are biased. You have an in inherent bias in your answers. Because it's your business, you desperately want it to succeed, and you desperately want people to say it's a very good proposition. So we get business experts to ask the questions and to analyse and verify the data so that they can tell you is your business really viable. And that's scored out of 100. So if you've got a score of 100, your business is perfect. You're on, in the marketplace. You don't have to worry. If your score is zero, it might mean one of two things. One, it might mean your, your idea really is useless and you should stop it there and then. But it might just mean you can't answer those questions because you haven't got the data to, to answer them yourself. And in those situations, we recruit people to bring in the data to verify what's going on. Now that's not the end of the story. Uh, these are weighting factors taken from international global best practice. So each of those sectors, those questions, aren't equally weighted and therefore we apply a weighting factor to give you your answer out of 10. And I will show you later on how we did this process for an academic member of staff who had a good idea in 2005 when I met him, and now it's a global international company. And I'll show you how we scored it and how we produced the end result. Are there any questions on that? Do you all use a process yourselves? Do you use a process like this? Similar. No? Yeah? Similar. Similar. Yeah, very good. Okay. So they basically break down into three tools. We have a software tool that looks at your technology and your intellectual property, looks at your profit margins and your um, financial data, and then the customer tool. I'll explain how they work now. The first one looks things like intellectual property. We will do an intellectual property health check very early on to establish that the company is not infringing other people's IP. And in the technological ICT area, the bad side is it is very, very easy to infringe other people's IP because it's click copying. So every time you click and copy something, you are more than likely infringing someone else's intellectual property. And the warning here is never 
touch Apple, you know, Getty Images, any of their copyright because they will sue you straight away. So we look at your position. When I go and talk to George, the question we ask is, have we got access to the, the software we need? And do we have to pay a license to someone to use that? And that's the first question we ask. This looks at your financials. These are simple business finances that everyone would want to know about. A bank, a venture capitalist, a business angel. They simply ask, what's my return on the investment I'm putting in? What's my internal rate of return? When am I going to break even? Start making a profit. What's the net present value of my business? And what's my intellectual property value? So this module will calculate these for you based on the data that you put in for your expected sales. And finally, the most important thing is we use something called voice of the customer. So how do you know your customer's going to buy something? Generally speaking, you ask them. Um, there are folks with the surveys you do in the street. So we do more sophisticated um, studies based on what we call usability studies. And they take, they take place in the Health Design Technology Institute. They are all filmed and all the data is analysed by our academic staff to see what the answers really are, what people mean. And therefore, from that, you can see whether the customers like your product, really like your product, hate it, and, and you can change it and modify it to reach your customers. So, voice of the customer is based on um, a theory, an academic theory, called the Kano theory. It's a Japanese marketer, and he put forward this proposition uh, about 20 years ago. And again, it's used by most businesses to work out what their customers really want to buy. I won't go into details, it's all available for you. So as a, as, a, as a university then, um, we will offer things in terms of financial support, which you should always need as a, as a company. We always protect our intellectual property, we pay for that. Um, what you've just seen is what we term a commercial opportunities appraisal process, or COA. And we will take that from every single person who comes forward and tells us what their idea is. We'll go through that process. And we then look at commercial feasibility. We will pay for market grants, um, proof of concept building, and then if the company is really worth starting, we'll pay for all of the registration of the company, which in the United Kingdom doesn't take long at all. In the UK, it costs about 25 euros to register a company, and you can do it on the same day if you want to. But generally, it takes about one week, and you've got your company started. Now, the other thing to say about a company when it starts is, what do you need to get in place? What do you need to secure, generally? Your domain name. Make sure your company has the domain name it needs to, to operate properly. And generally speaking for ICT companies, that means a domain name across the world. So you'll get your domain name .cn. We translate our domain names, we translate our trademarks into Chinese so that we're not in, infringed later on. So all of this stuff happens behind the scenes, if you like, just when the company is registered. Domain name, company name, trademarks, all these things are bought before the company really starts and you don't have a problem there. If you don't do that, you will have a problem later on. And then, when the company's already started, we will continue to pay for things like patent costs and IP up to national phase. We will always provide directors on the board of a company because the better quality directors you have, the more likely they are to succeed. And as a university, we put our own deans and our pro vice chancellor and our financial director, they sit on the board of startup companies to give the best support they possibly can. And if you can find somebody who's willing to sit on the board of your companies, who's really, really eminent in the profession, then I always recommend that you do that because it means a company has a better chance of survival. And we prepare venture capital elevator pitches, and you'll probably be doing something like that if you come to Coventry. Um, you'll be learning how to do your elevator pitches and how you present our business cases. Um, we will write business plans. We provide the legal documentation. We also provide R&D facilities, which I'll come to later. And we provide the asset management. So generally speaking, what we're saying is we will provide between, this is 30, 32,000 to about 80,000 euros of business support free to our staff um, to start the business. So they don't have to worry about that. It's not a burden for them. The other thing to say about freedom, if you are a member of staff and you want to start a business, um, I'm going to be quite controversial here, I'll say you cannot, cannot get a company surviving if you don't 
spend a lot of time away from the university working in the company. If you think you can do it in the evening or at the weekend and you can neglect your family and you can stop having holidays and your company will survive, it won't. You have to be very committed to starting a business and making sure it will survive. So as a university, we will buy out our academic members of staff time so they can spend between one and two days per week during the week, Monday to Friday, working solely on the company, away from their teaching commitments, away from their research commitments, so that they can make sure that company will survive. If you want a business to survive, you really should be spending 100% of your time on it. And what tends to happen is our academics will spend one or two days working on the business and still lecturing. If the company looks like it's going to be successful, they leave the university and they take up a directorship of the company. And the company, I'm going to explain to you later, this is exactly what happened. The academic is now the director of the company. He still uses the university laboratories, but he's not a member of staff at the university. And that is a decision you have to take as an individual. Because you might not want to give up your academic career, you might want to be an academic, and that's fine. But don't try and do both, because I think what will happen is you'll get frustrated, and the company is more likely going to fail because you're not spending enough time on it. So we will buy out um, staff at 1% equity per £5,000 of charge. And also we charge for laboratory uh, teaching relief as well. Any questions on that? Do, does your university do the same? You do? Yeah. Fine, excellent. We are in the beginning of the process. We are in the beginning now. I think the best time is now is to set the ground rules now and establish the right yeah. policies. That's why we're looking for your expertise to make this model. Yes, absolutely. Brilliant. Okay, so this is an example of one of those companies. This is called Exilica Limited. And the, uh, the academic in this case was an Australian. Uh, he worked in Australia. Uh, before he came to Coventry University. He's a life scientist and his invention was all around nanotechnology. He came up with tiny little spheres, which you can see there. These are about 1.2 microns in diameter and they will hold most chemicals in the periodic table, most elements, and they will release them very, very slowly. So you can see here why this is a brilliant technology. If you can capture something like a fragrance or a smell, and release it very slowly, and it has a lot of commercial advantage. Good thing about this product was it had at least five different business sectors, and it had, by the time it was launched, 25 customers. So when I said don't go for one customer, one sector, it had five sectors, 25 different companies. And this is their scoring. So when, when we did the scoring for this company early on, this is stage gate two. So this was the second gate after about a year, say, or less than that. And these are the scores that this, this company got. And the final score out of 10 was 5.34. So say it's 53%. So it's neither um, ready to start as a business, uh, but it's not a dead, a dead company. It's got good potential. Within six months, our next score was 7.71. And at this stage, uh, we launched the company. Now, the beauty of having uh, a stage gate process like this in place is you might have noticed that all of those questions are the, exactly the same questions that a business plan tries to answer. So when we got this data at gate four, we went to venture capitalists and said, this is what we've been doing over the last four or five years. They said, fantastic, you can see where it's going, and they put their money into the company. So it was launched at this stage, at stage gate four. And this is what we, we did, really, for the company. The Australian was very clever. The man who started it didn't publish anything for seven years. And that meant they were known, meant you could take a patent out on the technology. If you don't disclose something, you can patent it. If you disclose it, you can't patent it. So we took out several patents on the technology. Uh, we brought in a very, very good managing director at day one. So the day we started the company, we had a managing director in place who came in uh, he said he would work free of charge in the early days because the company proposition was very, very good. So he didn't charge us in the early days, but he had started many companies, was very successful. We brought in a financial director who was an accountant for one of our large big, big banks. So all of the um, financial side of the business was already watertight. 
Um, we gave the academic free laboratory space for three years. We said if you want to start your company, you can have free laboratory for three years. Thereafter, you'll start paying a rent. Um, we brought him out for two days a week to work on the company, so he was working at least two days of his time as an academic. He went on what we call the Medici Fellowship Programme. You might have heard of that. The Medici Fellowship Programme is what we call the mini MBA, Masters in Business. And over a three or four month period, all he did was learn how businesses operate. And he went on all of his modular training, was paid for by the university, and he got that qualification. So three months after starting, he got all the business training that he needed. Um, we got about £500,000 worth of investment into the business in the early days. And as I said, we had 25 customers, we had research sales already in place, and we had a lot of joint development contracts. So the business risk was reduced, and it looked like a really good proposition. And the other thing we did was network. You know, the, the, this business world is all about who you know, it's all about who you talk to, and therefore your sales go up. Um, so he used to attend every international conference going in the early days, and trade shows as well. And he got a lot of customers that way, and now we are producing this in quite high quantities. So that's a successful company. It's been going now since 2007, uh, and we are still an equity holder in that, although we don't hold as much as we used to. The man who started it still owns about half the equity in the company. Our most successful spin-out company by a long way is this one. Um, it's called Sprue Aegis. And Sprue Aegis um, has floated on the stock market. And it was a very good example of a student who came to me in 2000, year 2000. And he said, I've got a really good idea um, to replace battery-operated um, smoke alarms. Uh, we said, all right, have a look at this. And he said, all you have to do is unplug your light bulb, plug in your fire alarm, your smoke detector, and it'll work off the, uh, the mains. And therefore, there's no battery, and it'll always be operating. It will always be working. And from that basic idea, the company now is worth over $50 million. It has operations in Indonesia and China, manufacturing in those states. It has an R&D capability in Canada, and he is a multimillionaire. So, 14 years ago, he was a very poor student. And the story about this is so enticing that you've got to learn these kind of things is he's nearly failed three times in the business. And he nearly fit failed because he didn't really know who the customer was. And he succeeded by knocking on the door of a, of a company to buy his product late on on Christmas Eve in about 2003. If that buyer hadn't bought his product, he probably would have gone bust. But he did buy it, and from now, he's a multi-million dollar company. Um, it's a really good story, very hard work. But what made it successful? The introduction of a really brilliant managing director. As a student, he was struggling, and we were struggling really to get that access across the world. The managing director came in and said, this is how the business is going to be configured. This is what we're going to do. This is our five-year growth plan. And that really led, come in, <laughs> that, led <to> a really, <laughs> that led to a really successful business. And it's in household prices. And that's a model that we tend to use. Make sure the leadership's there, make sure the money is there, the product is right, you know who your customers are, and in that case, we're a very rich university on the back of that. And I think really, that's all I want to say on that. Um, George will go into a lot of detail tomorrow about digital um, companies, about apps, about augmented reality, about gaming, and all the things which are related to those kind of companies, and how they start, how they get their customers, how they sell their products, all of those things George will tell you tomorrow. But that really is all I have to say today. Thank you very much for listening. Are there any, any questions from anybody? On business side? Who wants to be an entrepreneur? <laughs> Very good. Имате възможност да зададете въпроси на професор Брайан Мур. Видяхте, че той а, представи теорията на предприемачеството с много примери. 
Може би всеки е бил по свой начин впечатлен от различните примери, но ви е направило впечатление, че в Ковентри технологичния парк и съответно университета, който гостики не представят, има разработена система за финансиране на инновативните студентски идеи. В рамките на този проект ние имаме предвидена точно такава дейност. Ние ще се опитаме да създадем такъв фонд, който да подкрепя иновативното мислене, креативното мислене на студентите. Аз се опитах, гледайки лицата тук, да подразбера от кои специалности са колегите, които са в залата. И забелязвам нещо, което евентуално утре ще бъде допълнено при представянето на разширена реалност и дигитални медии от колегите ни от Института за сериозни игри. Но ме се струва, че ние не трябва да мислим само, че дигиталното предприемачество това е област на компютърните технологии или това е област на менеджмента и маркетинга, т.е. специалистите в тази област. Какво излиза? Че ние живееме в едно време, когато всички области са следи. Т.е. няма граници, за да върви бизнеса напред. И може би този начин на мислени трябва да определи нашата аудитория. Защото тук има и правни аспекти на интелектуалната собственост, това за което стана дума. Аз тук не виждам, например, колеги от този факултет с малки, така, разбира се, добри примери на този факултет. Но имайки в предвид, че не беше представена организационната структура на предприемчивия университет, Университия в Ковантри, който спечели наградата за най-предприемчив университет на миналата година и тази година в класацията на топ Морден, така наречени университети, е отново на първо място. С това искам да кажа, че ние имаме уникалния шанс да чуваме експертизата на колеги, които са наистина от топ университет. Така че нека да се възползваме Позволих си да кажа тези думи, за да може вие да си помислите, ако има въпроси. Въпроси, които са свързани с обучението, с приложените изследвания в нашия университет, как биха могли те да бъдат още по-засилени като връзки, подкрепата, която вие получавате от нас, преподавателите, особено за съвети и консултации, насочени в бизнес-ориентиране. Тук може би от презентирането на Брайан, вие чухте познати термини, това, което ние преподавателите сме ви предлагали като теория, което е точно в тона на нашата презентация днес. Тоест, вие имате бейграунта, вие сте запознати. Нека на базата на това, което видяхме в тази прекрасна презентация, пълна с примери, да се породят въпроси. Тези въпроси в голяма степен могат в началото да не бъдат много конкретни колеги. Правя това във видение, за да ви предразположа да питате. Защото в първия ден, даже ние когато се говорихме с гостите, дали първия ден ще има въпроси? И аз казах, може би първия ден ще бъде едно опознаване на аудиторията с лекторите. Може би втория ден ще бъдат повече въпроси. Но нека да има тази връзка, която ние най-вече ще спечелиме. И ще ми се да ви насоча и в още една посока. Това, което при нас върви като модел на обучение в Аплодетния, създаване на учебно-тренировачните фирми. Какви идеи генерират именно тези групи студенти? Дали те са точно групите, които трябва да бъдат сформирани? Това е с учена специалност. Това, което дълго време ние си говорим е в университета. Нека да има движение между специалностите в екипната работа, точно по проектни идеи. Не всеки да се вписва само в своя учебен план. Може би забелязахте, че Брайан спомена студента си избира патеката, дисциплините, по които той ще си оформи 
бизнес ориентацията, т.е. какво ме е необходимо на него, за да оформи един успешен бизнес. Защо да ни помислим и ние в университета да направим нещо подобно? Направим такива екипи, които да са от различни специалности и които да вървят по една отделна писта. Тази писта пак ще си бъде писта, която е на учебните планове. Но тя ще бъде писта, която ще бъде наистина новаторска. И винаги гледаме преподавателите и акредитацията. Това ни трябва от учебен план толкова часа, но не може повече часове тук. Тук трябва да бъда толкова и така нататък. Нека да се опитаме наистина, използвайки този проект, да направим една новаторска линия на обучение. Това са мои, така както казва професор Павлов, нашия заместник ректор, не вече са ни мисли. Но аз ви ги хвърлям, за да може вие да помислите и да дадете конкретни предложения и да зададете вашите въпроси. Вижно, аз се впечатлих от примера, даде може би и вие, за студента, бедния студент от 2003 година, който вече е милионер. Не, той е бил беден, казвам. Бедния студент, който е стартирал в 2003-та и вече е милионер. И така нататък, и така нататък. Могат да бъдат много тези въвеждащи думи в основата на презентацията на Брайан. Аз ще се радвам, ако има въпроси. Ако искате, ако се притеснявате от аудиторията, тези въпроси могат да бъдат зададени персонално на колегите. Но нека да извлечеме максимално добавената стоеност от тяхното посещение тук. Още повече, че държа да спомена пред вас нещо, което е отпутната на организацията. Професор Брайан Мур има изключително пълен план на ангажименти. Той похвално каца в България на полет за Брюксел. Той отлага ангажимент само за да дойде при нас. Това е, бих искала да ви кажа, някаква оценка и за нас като университет. Така че да благодариме още един път на професор Мур. И да отворим дебатите, дискусиите. Аз започна с това въведение. Има ли някой, който да сподели нещо, като впечатления, като мнение, заповядайте колега. Само моля да си представяте специалността и името, за да се ориентира нашия колега Кован Душ, все пак точно персонала. Аз ще искам да превеждам. Аз мога да говоря. А, на английски? Окей. Хайде. И дингриш. Hello, my name is Milen. Would you please stand up and speak loudly? Hello, my name is Milen. I am studying my master's degree for leadership in global environment. Yes. So my question is, do you approach every idea equally and who decides what? How big is the team of people who are in charge? Which idea should go forward first and which idea should be maybe in the back end? Right, very good question. Thank you, very good question. Uh, first answer is yes. Every single idea we receive is always treated on exactly the same level, uh, whether that's from student, staff or from alumni. So we carry out that assessment exactly the same for every single idea. Uh, the team that do the assessment uh, as three people at least. Um, the number of business development staff in the university who can bring in the ideas is 35. Um, so it's quite a big team. Uh, the last question is I make the decision uh, <laughs> <laughs> with, with consultation with my team. Uh, generally speaking, the scores will give you a very good idea of um, A, whether the idea is good, but more importantly, it's your motivation and how enthusiastic you are in bringing the idea to market. Because if, uh, if someone wants us to do everything, it's not going to work. We are a business support team. Um, but if you want to work with us, we will give all the support we possibly can. And that will continue until the company is in revenue and it's generating money and can go on its own. So we'll support you right up to the stage where you're making money. 
But no idea is ever discarded without doing a proper assessment. Uh, what about personal feelings towards the idea? Maybe one of the people in the team says, I don't like it because of my personal well, experience. You've got, you've got to ignore those. It's, it's, that's why you do it with at least three people. There's an interesting point. If you have three people who do that commercial assessment pro process, they will never get more than 5% out on the score. Because it, it, it's a, a rigorous process. It takes out the bias. Um, and we will ignore somebody who's got you know, a problem against an individual. That, that won't come into it. It's to do with the business. It's the idea. Yeah, it's the idea. Yeah. Because always remember that you know, a, a bad idea or a poor idea in the hands of a very good team will be successful. And a very good idea in the hands of a bad team will fail. You know, we have to be very, very open about how we assess it and the feedback we give. We give you know, the staff and students the opportunity to, you know, to argue their case. And if we make a mistake, I have to say, you know, we've let a really good idea go. And it does happen sometimes, but generally, you know, we, we have a team that make that scoring in place. Yeah. Was there ever a time when there were too many ideas and there was not enough time for assessment? Always. <laughs> Always. We never have any time. We have um, about 100 uh, to 150 ideas presented to us uh, every year. Uh, and the team of three people then have to make sure we go through that process. I am always getting more staff working for me because this is so important in the university. You know, the technology transfer and commercialization is important, so we get more and more staff who get trained to do this. And we're going to be training six people from Italy this summer in doing the tra technology transfer. They're coming from Pisa and Siena universities for six months. So you know, we're very keen to learn from other people because we, we will make mistakes, but at least we can justify how we've got there. Yes, but uh, don't you consider because the United Kingdom is so far ahead in, in the economy that this gives you an advantage as far as starting a business? Uh, no. It's no, I think, you know, countries. to be fair, it is a global economy. And, um, and if I was to be really honest, we get more money from the United States of America uh, than we do from the United Kingdom. The US venture capital market is 10 times bigger than, uh, than the UK. So we go where, we follow where the best people are. And it's a global economy. You don't have to be restricted to your own area. Except for Ukraine. I said for Ukraine, yes. We, we, we'll pray for Ukraine. Yeah, we wouldn't go. But yeah, yeah, you're right. You, you tend to find there are certain um, funding routes in, around the world, which is better for us to go. Because the market tendencies revolve around the most advanced countries and not as far as... <coughs> no, to be fair, if you, if you have a very good business idea and it's been well researched and it's well presented, you should be able to stand in front of any audience and they will see the value in that business and put their money into it. And that's what we try to instill in all of our students. You know, you're not really selling it to me. I'm the first person, but you're selling it to any venture capitalist. You know, Bill Gates could be standing here and he could say, what a great idea, I'll put my money into it. But if you don't answer those questions, all that happens is I'll say, come back again in three weeks' time, come back again in a few months' time, and we'll answer it then. So I think you need to broaden your vision. You know, a good idea on the internet is a good idea for 30 billion people. It's not just where you are. It might be difficult to get local money, but then broaden it out, you know, get a good business proposition together and people will listen to you. Thank you very yeah. much. It's a pleasure. And you need the break. <laughs>
out of 100 to be, to be businesses. So there are a lot that don't, don't make it. Do you know the percent of successful of these companies actually successful in the actual business? Uh, not only in the training session. We used to, used to be, I'm not talking about this year, but 18% of our companies are very successful. And 50%, we call them, you know, ambling along. They don't lose money, but they don't make a lot of money. So, you know, 70% are not going to be failures. About 30% will fail at some stage. Uh, usually within the first three years, you know, if your business isn't going to be successful, it will usually, usually fail within three years. So we currently have about 200 companies which are still going uh, around, the, around the world. And another question. It's interesting for me that um, you said that you have to know for whom we're going to sell yes. our product yes. and who's going to buy that. Yes. Yes. But is it a possibility we make them or we convince them that our product is worth it to... You, you to can. Them? You can do that. Yeah. A, a, a disruptive technology or something that's completely new that does come around, absolutely. But then it's it's a really hard selling job, isn't it? Because unless you're in an area where people have to buy it, that's what I'm saying. If, if you sell to 14 to 24 year olds a new gimmick, it'll sell really well. But you know, if it's disruptive, it's hard work for you to convince what's generally quite a conservative public. You know, people tend to want to see things proven before they buy it. So it's a harder job for you if it's a disruptive technology. But it's not impossible. And the other thing you will find is if it's disruptive, you will upset an awful lot of existing companies who are your competitors. And what we have to then do is say, well, how will these competitors react to this brand new technology? This but silica technology was brand new. You know, it was, it was replacing a lot of stuff. Um, and all the competitors would just say, it's not worth buying, that kind of stuff. So our business plan had to answer all those questions as well. So the competition starts saying it's not worth buying, and then we have to say, yes, it is. These are all the advantages. I'm not saying it's not impossible, but it is harder for a breakthrough disruptive technology than a, a modification of something which people can understand. Stick at it, that's the thing. <laughs> and don't be too despondent, because some companies will spend five years in the incubation stage, and that's the time when you have to have the tenacity to keep going. You know, don't give up in the first five years, and then when things pick up, you'll be okay. Back to the Council of the Master of Management. Uh, Magister's program. Uh, my question is about the uh, uh, just to present you. Uh, uh, the Master of 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 the Приведите на ли показвам да кажа, че ви извинявам се, което сте. Беше чудесно презентацията да я чуем и да я видим на проблема, който ни интересува специално нас. Как в България това ще си примени на практика и евентуално, вижто аз съм потърпевш от три от моите идеи са откраднати. Как ще направим това да защитим, как да кажа, основата на идеите си, да извлечем полза максимално от тях, а да не ни ги... Да, понеже в нашата географска ширина това е много трудно да се възползва човек от, от правото си, което по принцип имаме. Is that we, uh, we we always we always protect it first in the UK. Uh, we will always take a patent out, but we will always make sure when we talk to uh, anybody about businesses, they sign a non-disclosure agreement. Now it might not be worth the paper it's written on in Bulgaria. I don't know, but but it's always a, a legal recourse for us. So if somebody takes our idea 
and we've got the non-disclosure agreement, then we can stop them. And, and the thing is about our university has uh, the, the money behind it to be able to take people to court. So we will sue people for IP infringement. Uh, and I'm always telling people, be as careful as you can be. I mean, I don't know whether yours was copyright based or a patent based, but whatever the IP is, you know, we always protect it first and we always, we will always take action against people who infringe our IP. There, there are some... Oh, sorry. Yes. Компанията, И аз само ще допълна нещо, че в момента има такива грантови схеми, като например Националния инновационен фонд, по който вие можете да дадете проект, и подавайки този проект, вие можете да се защитите, примерно продукт, софтуер, методика и така нататък. Така че има и други по-леки стъпки, за да направите защитата си. Но той спомена за другите държави, чухте, нали? А пък ние казваме, че в България е и как си. Трябва да ви кажа, колеги, че насякъде по света е едно и също. И трябва да считаме, че ние сме нещо по-различно на Балканите, нали? като балканска психика. Насякъде е това. Нещо ви скати ли още? Не, 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 we, we, we do select countries very carefully because in China we have a lot of infringement of intellectual property. So our policy in China is different from the European Union and the United States. It's, it's being careful before you go into the market is very important. <laughs> Я много мотива вече, че думи са имали смисъл, така че се провокираха въпроси. А може би трябва да вметнем, че този семинар и съответно утрешния са свързани с определене на групата от вас, която ще прави това, което колегата спомена, както от други университети и за той конкретно спомена, ще работят там в Ковантри по теми, ще генерират проектни идеи, Така че тези, които взеха отношение, всички останали в аудиторията, са потенциални участници в тези визити до Ковън. Така че, ако смятате, че днес сте се поуморили от затухата, а вдига се ръка, разбира се. Заповядайте. Uh, I think that uh, if we have some students with pretty ideas yes. and want to work with your students in Coventry, yes. do you make a vir virtual uh, platform and work together without going to Coventry or yeah. going to Bulgaria? Absolutely. Some strategic yeah. relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, we have, yeah. we have already regulated that platform. Yeah. It's e-working space. You can have the URL going to the website of the university, projects, the, the name of the project, and the address is, is there. So, if working platform, the developer of that platform is Milan Sukir, he is here, over there, you can ask him to give you a username and okay, How do you think to fight the uh, lack of time for our students? with the lack of our time. We, we have to meet uh, with other students. Could we um, arrange that? Yes, we are now in the process of arranging that visits. Okay. The, the time and the duration will maybe tomorrow in the afternoon we'll think about them. You will understand from your finger, from your G, about some details from me also. So I see that there are 
Interest a lot, a lot of interest there. So. There will be more after George's talk. Yeah. 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 Yes, we'll be pleased, pleased, to, pleased to welcome you at Coventry. You keep the same. Yes. The same. <laughs> okay. Colleagues, so far we've planned to do a seminar, as we said. If we don't have any more questions, we'll announce the day of today. за приключен, официално, неофициално, винаги можете да задавате въпросите си към нашите експерти. Благодаря.